which has to do with the nature of uh, uh, the entire space of political communications, what is normally described as the public sphere. As Frederick has already introduced a bit uh, in the introduction, I mean, throughout my, my work, I've been interested in the transformation of politics in digital times, looking at different aspects of politics, namely uh, social movements, that was my, my first work, then looking at political parties, and more recently looking at the state, so looking at very different pillars in a way of politics and how they evolved through the digital era. And my current interest lies in, uh, uh, in the public sphere in a sense of the space of discussion, the space for the circulation of information and opinion, and how the changing public sphere articulates the relationship between uh, citizens and power holders. So uh, what I'm going to give you here is a very... Um, general, in a way, and, and theoretical uh, presentation, but perhaps is something that would be uh, a good starting point for some discussion among us on where research could take us, or what kind of research agenda we could develop on, on, on these topics. So the starting point is quite obvious, I think, for people in this room, namely the fact that in recent years, uh, perhaps more precisely in the last decade, starting from the, the 2010s, basically, the decade we just left, we have experienced a seismic shift in the nature of political communication. Political communication broadly defined as the set of media, media practices, sources, channels that have a bearing on uh, political decisions, that have a bearing on the political process. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about what this new space may be about, right? I mean, and, and partly this idea of a digital public sphere and cyber public sphere or cyber public sphere is very much about this notion. And obviously from a quantitative or structural perspective, the main uh, um, trend there, the main shift there is growing importance, growing influence of social media on uh, political communication, and specifically of social media as a source of political information. I mean, the Pew Research Center, which is one of the most creditable uh, centers looking at these issues, for example, has been documenting how throughout the years the number of people getting news from social media sites has been growing and growing, and how comparatively uh, more Americans get news from social media than, than other media, uh, for example, uh, now more people get political information from social media and from newspapers. And as you can see there, also the share uh, receiving information, political information from TV, which was the dominant medium of the previous technological era, is, always, is also receding. This split in terms of uh, uh, the sources of information is very strongly defined by age. Right, so if we look at different age cohorts, obviously we, we shall see that older people still receive most of the information via TV and, and the press, while the case for younger age cohorts increasingly leans towards social media being, being the, the dominant form of information. Uh, more generally, what is important about social media is the fact that they are not just a space for the circulation of information, but they are a space for discussion on information. That is, in a way, the added value that they've been introducing. The fact that people uh, without filters, by means of self-publishing, can discuss any issue of interest uh, ranging from current events uh, to whatever climate change, the pandemic, you name it, right? We know it from it's something that doesn't really need to be argued that much because it's something we know from everyday experience, something we know from our timelines. And we also know that it's something quite controversial and uh, um, conflict-ridden in a sense that it is associated with many things that are going wrong with our politics. Populist right, fake news, manipulation of information, disinformation, right? especially in recent years, whereas in the early 2010s there was more optimism about the potential of social media and their role in progressive movements, their role as a means of mobilization, especially in the second half of the 2010s, 
because of the rise of many populist right campaigns and candidates, Donald Trump, Matteo Salvini, Jair Bolsonaro, and so on and so forth, there has been a more pessimistic assessment of the influence of uh, these media communication. And fake news, uh, the infodemic, as it has been described, that running parallel to, to the pandemic is just an example of that. As is the development of new social media, uh, dedicated social media, or politically de dedicated, such as Truth, the new social media channel created by, by Donald Trump, which aims at creating a sort of uh, uh, mm, uh, protective space where the alt-right can articulate its discussion without fear of being censored or what they see as, as censorship. So this is just to justify why this is important as something to study. This is a phenomenon that is now, I mean, whereas until recently, people who were studying digital politics were looked as exotic creatures, who were studying something quite new but very marginal, bit by bit, political communication has been absorbed by and large by digital communication, or very strongly influenced by digital communication. And more generally, the battle for consensus in our politics is by and large defined by the ability to use social networks and social media as a space to persuade people and to mobilize your uh, uh, public opinion of support. So how are we to understand this change in the very space of communication? I mean, the mm, dedicated notion, the traditional notion used for this purpose is the notion of, of public sphere, a notion that was uh, publicized by Jürgen Habermas, the famous uh, critical theory philosopher, he represented as a young man with a kind of hipster attire. And uh, I think most of you are familiar, or all of you are familiar with his theory, given that probably is the most influential theory in media communications, definitely is the most cited theory in, 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 in uh, media communications. And the founding block there is the book to the left, Struktur van der Fentlichkeit, the Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, which is a sort of uh, historical work about how information and communication systems evolved in the decisive time between the 17th and the 18th century, giving way to the modern press. And the way in which the commodification of information, the fact that the information was, became a market, how it paradoxically led to uh, openness uh, of information. The fact that information was not anymore premised on access to aristocratic spaces, such as the courtly space around the king, but as long as you had the money to buy, to purchase information, you could access information. And equally, if not more influential, has been these, these uh, very heavy tomes on the theory of communicative action, where Habermas uh, extrapolated some sociological elements he found in the bourgeois public sphere to develop a theory of rational argumentation. The idea that uh, communication as a rational activity is one oriented towards the reaching of a consensus among different parties involved, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I mentioned this as a term of comparison for analyzing what is a public sphere now. The important thing about the theory of the public sphere is uh, the way in which, while Habermas was an anti-functionalist, or is an anti-functionalist, uh, as the theory has been absorbed in the US academia, it has been married with functionalism. Right? So that is why it has also become important conceptually because it allows to say through these, uh, uh, as this diagram stands to represent, that the debates and discussions happening in the public sphere are not self-standing or uh, how would you say, um, onto themselves, something onto themselves. But they are, are important insofar as the assumption is that the forming points of consensus in public debates then go on informing the decisions of politicians. The public sphere agenda becomes the policy agenda. Right? We know that in reality that may not be the case, or, uh, or maybe so to a limited extent, but I think conceptually it's something very important to understand. Uh, and an important explanation as to why the theory of the public sphere became so influential. Because it provided this link between 
what the media is saying and what politicians are doing. So now, in uh, recent years, many scholars in new media studies have tried to make the leap, to make the link, really, between Habermas's theory of the public sphere and the current system of communication to say that what we're witnessing is fundamentally the development of a digital public sphere or a virtual public sphere, uh, which partly resembles the one described by Habermas and partly doesn't, is more decentralized, as Izzy Pacharisi, uh, the author of these two books, uh, puts it, is more effective, right, rather than informational, uh, is more of a private sphere in a sense that it is more personalized as well as social media are to a great extent. But I think that, in a way, this discussion of social media as a new public sphere often just scratches the surface, really, of, of, of the questions. I mean, we still lack a coherent and uh, uh, systemic theoretical framework to get to grips with what is going on in contemporary communications. And what is more, we still lack an empirically grounded theory that doesn't just counterpose the theory of Habermas with empirical reality, often looking at contemporary empirical reality as a sort of bad comparison vis-a-vis -vis the idealized normative public sphere. Uh, but we need something that really conjoin uh, a normative theory and sociological empirical analysis of what is going on. So that is a bit the spirit of the research agenda I'm hereby proposing. So a first starting point for me is uh, that to understand the social sphere as a shortening of the social media public sphere, uh, we need to understand that the public sphere that Abramas described was only one of many types of public sphere that always exist at the same time in different societies. That is, at any historical time, there is not just one public sphere that encompasses them all, but there are different ones that are layered and counterposed to one another. Uh, two students, two uh, research assistants of uh, uh, Abermas, Oscar Necht and Alexander Kluge, already identified these when they talked about what they described as the proletarian public sphere. So what they were referring to there was that what Abermas was describing was not the public sphere as such, but the bourgeois public sphere. And therefore they said, all right, we are going to instead look at the proletarian public sphere, which they mostly identify with a space of production, workplaces, and so on and so forth. And they said that the proletarian public sphere also had a different logic vis-a-vis -vis the bourgeois public sphere. Whereas the bourgeois public sphere was based on a logic of opinion, in German, Anung, the proletarian public sphere revolved around the logic of experience, in German, Erfahrung. Right? So it was not just different classes, define different public spheres, but he also had different logics. Habermas himself, in the second preface, or in the preface to the second edition of the social transformation of the public sphere, refers to the plebeian public sphere, right? which is, again, is a different concept from bourgeois, but also from proletarian. And obviously, the plebeian reference is a reference to, to ancient Rome, to the struggle of the plebs, such as the secessio plebis, these famous strikes of the peasants, of the Roman poor that for uh, weeks decided to lay their, down their tools and say, let's see if the patricians can cook, bake their bread for themselves and prepare their food for themselves uh, and we are not going to work, and which was actually a way to which they won rights. But there is just an example of many things that were part of plebeian experience. Um, revolution protest, but also games, uh, distribution of uh, bread or uh, uh, wheat, uh, public events, festivals, uh, theater plays, and so on and so forth. And actually, that is an element that for Habermas was also present in other historical phenomena. For example, the French Revolution also had its own uh, plebeian public sphere. It had a bourgeois public sphere made of newspapers, the bourgeoisie, the Jacobin Club, but at the same time it had another layer, which was this more popular or plebeian public sphere. Which is also a way to make sense of another aspect that was not comprised in uh, Abermas's original analysis of the public sphere, namely social movements. 
while Habermas discusses social movements a bit in his theory of communicative action, uh, really is only, they are only described as a sort of marginal part of the system. While we know from experience that social movements are in fact an important source of ideas and points of consensus that emerge in society. So I made my first claim, namely to understand the social media public sphere, we need to understand it as a plebeian public sphere. What is unique to this public sphere vis-a-vis -vis other public spheres is that social media have introduced a functionality of self-publishing which eliminates gatekeeping, namely the institutional role of certain media nodes to decide what is fit to print and not fit to print. Uh, that is something quite quaint by now, quite trivial, that we have come to accept, at least all those who have been born, say, uh, less than 30 years ago. Uh, uh, but it's something that is actually quite revolutionary in terms of uh, the political economy of communication. Uh, one approach from a kind of positive angle, we can say that this is the first historical era in which ordinary people write their opinions in public. Not only speak their mind in public, but write in public. In a sense, when people are intervening on social media, on Facebook, posting their ideas, or sharing content, or intervening in discussions, is something quite new, historically, it didn't happen before, and the fact that they often do that in, uh, with spelling mistakes, with grammar mistakes, right, is something that is often kind of singled out to show that the plebs are stupid or that many users are stupid. But it really bespeaks, in a way, the suspicion of the plebs, the suspicion of, of the masses that has, long, that has been there for a long time. So, I mean, th this is my, my understanding is that to understand the social media public sphere, we need to capture this element, both of potential and danger in the contemporary public sphere. The fact that it is a public sphere where the masses have a possibility to express themselves. Then it is a matter, uh, another matter, whether that communication is. Uh, progressive or aggressive, authoritarian or democratic, dangerous or non-dangerous, but that is a very important starting point. The second thesis that I want to develop is that to understand the plebeian or the cyber plebeian public sphere, we need to understand it as a public sphere dominated by crowds, by online crowds, whose subject of reference are crowds. Now, when we think about a crowd, what are we thinking about? We are thinking about a gathering, a physical gathering of people, in public spaces, typically a square, uh, be it to celebrate the victory of uh, Barcelona in the Champions League or uh, to protest uh, against uh, the austerity policies of government, in both cases in Plaza de Catalunya in, in Barcelona, it has been the kind of typical place where people gather. Uh, different types of crowd exist. They can be festive, they can be uh, riots, they can be celebratory, they can be mourning. Uh, crowds, but we know very clearly what is meant by that. Right? It is a type of event, a type of activity where people physically come together, physically assemble for a limited period of time in a certain place and then disperse. Now, we also know uh, what the crowd became to be associated with. I mean, theories such as uh, Gustave Le Bon in France famously described the crowd as irrational, emotional, um, callous, which means cruel basically in, in, in English, and therefore as something dangerous and as something that represented almost a kind of primitive state of the social mind, right, that would be overcome uh, later on. So it is quite in a way disorienting when we see in contemporary discourse people referring to an online crowd. It has really become a, a part of the landscape of, of analysis of new media and, and political communication from Howard Rheingold in 2004 to, talking about smart mobs to James Surovieczki, The Wisdom of Crowds to the more recent book by McAfee and Brinjolfson about crowds and, and platforms. So there is this general sense that we live in a new era of crowds. Besides these books, uh, think about the use of crowdsourcing, uh, 
uh, about the idea of crowd empowered or crowd enabled. I mean, the term crowd is really thrown in the mix very often. Fundamentally to describe a type of uh, action or online uh, collaboration that is characterized by a mass element where quantity is important, that is lowly organized, that doesn't require the presence of an organization, and finally that is ad hoc in character or it has a kind of limited temporal uh, durability. It may last for a day, for an hour, for one month, but it doesn't have a permanent structure, uh, nor an explicit structure carrying it on. Now, often when people think about the type of social structure that underpins communication and organization online, they think about networks, right? This has become a kind of common term. But actually, networks themselves are not defined only by links, point-to-point -point links, between different nodes. They're also defined by clustering tendencies, which are instead typical of crowds, where actually the singular identity or connections of a given node is not the most important thing. What matters instead is the kind of focal tendency, the tendency of all nodes to group together as part of a common crowd. Represented here is an example of this tendency is the visualization of different tribes or different groups emerging discussion in the Battle of Vinegar Twitter conversations which took place in Brazil in the early 2010s, parallelly in the famous protest of June in, in Brazil. Or think about the clustering of climate conversations where there, are, uh, there is a tendency for groups to come together and to face one another. For example, climate uh, septics, obviously. And I, I don't know what you call the opposite of climate septics. I mean, people who basically abide by the science and say climate change is dangerous on the one hand, and on the other hand, people who are sceptics, namely say that it is all a big invention of Tesla or Elon Musk to sell more cars and whatever. And obviously, we see similar crowding and clustering tendencies in debates about the pandemic, right? uh, where these Novax, anti-vax opposition uh, Provax or and Novax opposition has become very prominent. In a way, every day almost has become dominated by controversies. Uh, what the group around Bruno Latour in France called the controverse, namely uh, discursive conflicts, which are also epistemic conflicts, which are pitting different groups, different online crowds, one against the other. Another um, visualization of crowds is temporal, not spatial, not in terms of the kind of network structure, but in terms of spatiality. This is a graph coming from my own research, from a paper looking at online, what I described at the time as online enthusiasm. And it shows the level of likes and comments on the Kulina Khaled Said Facebook page, which was a central organizational hub in the Egyptian revolution, showing how it has a typical crowd-like tendency with peaks of uh, uh, euphoria followed by valleys of dysphoria, moments of depression and demobilization, which is typical of, of crowds because as, we, uh, as I said before, what is one of the characteristics of crowds vis-a-vis -vis more permanent organizations is the fact that they appear, come together, manifest themselves in a so-called space of appearances and then fade away, disappear in a situation of latency where uh, nobody really knows where they've gone, where they have dispersed. While with permanent organizations, there's always a door that can be knocked, right? There's always a standing representation that can be looked for. So this is a bit the kind of general conceptual terrain that I wanted to introduce. In the last five minutes, I'll just go for uh, the so what question. I mean, uh, namely, why is it important to study this? Why is this significant? what could be the implications of studying crowds, and also what could be the methodological approaches by means of which we, we make sense of crowds. So the first implication is, uh, uh, is counterintuitive, the counterintuitive character of, of this return of crowds. One of the most influential uh, authors uh, about crowds and their historical evolution was Gabriel Tard, another sociologist working more or less at the same time as, as Gustave Le Bon, 
who authored the very famous essay on the public and the crowd. He considered the public and the crowd as uh, the two most prominent uh, forms of collective organization in modern society. In his view, the crowd was the most uh, unrefined and primitive element, while the public, being dependent on mediated communication, was instead the one who was more contemporary, more actual, and also the one who was bound to develop more going into the future. A future society would have been a society of publics rather than a society of crowds, because what defined crowds is personal connection enabled by physical proximity. While with publics, the exchanges among individuals, and for Tart, the unit of analysis was the individual, uh, happen at a distance. They are mediated through distance communication. Instead, what we see with the online crowds is a sort of weird hybrid form, if you think about it, between publics and crowds, of publics, it retains that mediated element, namely the fact that the collective action is carried out at a distance, without physical proximity being a condition, a requirement for collective participation. At the same time, many aspects of these collective aggregates are described like crowds and are perceived like crowds because they reflect in these uh, certain elements of crowds. Uh, again, the, the impromptu character, the fact that they appear and disappear, their time-limited character, their highly conflictual character, like is online crowds are not about debating or discussing or arguing, they're about fighting, and they are defined that way. And also the fact that often, by participants, participation in them is not felt like communication, but more like action, doing things together. For example, a trolling attack, or piling on the comments on a tweet that was particularly unpopular, and so on and so forth. So here, in, in this bulleted list, uh, in this numbered list, I mean, are some elements of these mediated crowds, the impromptu character of online gatherings, the thickness associated with them. From an experiential perspective, the perception that behavior has to do with an experience of gathering in some way or form. Uh, the American cultural theorist Mark Poster already in the 90s uh, said that the new space of mass gathering was not anymore squares, street corners, streets, but was increasingly websites. That's where the new masses were coming together. And it's something that we can see every day on social media by looking at the metrics of likes, of reactions, at the number of comments, at the quantity Really, kind of the, the molar uh, character of, of interactions. Third, the apparent spontaneity of this organized character. So what <coughs> defines a crowd vis-a-vis -vis an organization, as I said before, is the fact that there is at least a perception that it is spontaneous or, or disorganized, or at least lowly organized. The strong conflictual or, or tribal character is something that against Le Bon associated with the irrational element of crowds, uh, but we know that crowds have a very bounded nature. Don't go to a Barcelona supporters crowd saying you are a Juventus fan after a Champions final, right? Because you may regret, you might may regret doing that. Uh, yet, and this is why they are mediated in most cases, is interaction at a distance. So just some final points on how this could be developed. I mean, uh, one element has to do precisely with overcoming the view of the public sphere and publics as consensus-oriented, as oriented towards rational argumentation and finding some agreements everybody can coincide on. While as philosophers and political theorists such as Chantal Mouffes have told us, conflict is inherent in politics. Politics has always been about conflict. Thinking that politics can achieve a point of consensus is a pious illusion which can actually also sometimes be a dangerous illusion. Instead, it needs to be accepted that in society there are people whose views will never be reconciled and partly democracy is a mechanism to cope with this lack of agreement by means of majority rule 
meaning that whoever is in power at the time decides which ideas at consensus without requiring people to subscribe to the consensus in this way. So this idea of agonistics, this idea of accepting divides in society, I think is a very healthy premise. Though what remains open is to establish how does this conflict between different ideas play out? How do different crowds confront each other, fight against one another? How do they score victories or uh, defeats? What are the conditions for success in these uh, conflicts, in these ideational conflicts, in these conflict of ideas between different groups? Right? What are the ways in which coalition of ideas can expand by uh, linking to other groups, right? by expanding their frames? I mean, there's many conceptual and uh, questions that still need to be uh, discussed there. And there's a number of methodological challenges as we are studying uh, online crowds in the social media public sphere. First is the invisibility of the online crowd. You cannot really photograph it, right? Because it's people in different places. It's also very difficult to visualize, to picture. But it leaves traces behind. Traces in the form of metrics, traces in the form of uh, comments, traces in the form of activity. It is invisible, but it is tangible, paradoxically. Uh, the second methodological challenge is the need to complement Habermas' idea of communicative rationality as oriented towards consensus, towards the issue consensus, with the acceptance of the conflictual and contentious character of politics. But, but in a way, try to navigate the uncertain terrain between these two things, conflict and consensus. Conflict can sometimes lead to partial consensus, inter-consensus can be broken up into new conflicts. I think that the interaction between these two poles is what really matters to understand social media contention. Uh, finally, from a purely methodological perspective, I think we still need to work towards an integration of big data analysis and small data understanding, quantitative and qualitative analysis uh, and of the motivations and actual social practices going on in, in the social media public sphere. Uh, also, starting with uh, uh, the question or, or lending more attention to the question of what are the underlying motivations and understandings people <coughs> carry to these ongoing opinion battles or ideational battles online. Right? Because the online world is not just a technical world made of platforms, affordances, technologies, procedures, protocols, databases, and so on and so forth, but it is also a social world structured by rituals, structured by roles, governed by etiquettes, governed by expectations and assumptions. And I think that this aspect of the social media public sphere, if anything, is the one that we are still very far from cracking. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo. Uh, <clears throat> we said it was 20 minutes, but <laughs> Thanks for this wonderful presentation and inspiring. We have uh, about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, I don't know if any of you, excuse me, if any of you would like to ask any question to Paolo, we have the opportunity to have him here. So I think that probably you may have questions. So feel free. I have one. Yeah, so I can start. Um, just a, it's like a, a question on the crowds thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've been trading this thing of crowds, and I feel closer. Maybe it's not a central aspect. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I feel closer to cultural studies and Raymond Williams uh, saying that there there is no mass, only ways of seeing the mass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you think that using the word crowds or mass can have an impact on the way we see the crowd itself mm -hmm. in the sense that there's a kind of depersonalization of the individual there, yeah? And you said something about that when talking about the bond, but it was not only the bond of the I said, talking about the, the bond the massa in a really uh, terrible way. No, really, the, the, you started talking about the proletarian, yeah, mm -hmm. as a, a positive thing, I, I guess, I think, but 
the, the, the mass man needs something that is closer to an animal, yeah, a beast, not mm -hmm. a person. So how do you manage this, this concept, yeah, that could mm -hmm. be substituted, just questioning, with the word community, which is different, mm -hmm. and associated to complexity and em emergence, yeah, mm -hmm. in some senses. Well, this is the question because yeah. it's like philosophical. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Because I have some I have always had doubts in using the word mass mm -hmm. and using the word crowd because of these mm -hmm. connotations, yeah? Yes, and, and I think I mean it's a matter of how you say of the relationship between the terminology used by academics and the uh, terminology used by actors within the field. Uh, and in a way, if one follows a kind of more sociological approach, one needs to accept the terms that are emerging from the folk discourse of the community one is analyzing. Uh, and to un also understand why, in a way, those discourses are emerging. Because I mean, the way in which, in uh, what you say, digital expert circles, the term crowd is used is not altogether different from, from network. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an aggregate that is flexible, that is temporary, you know, but it adds more of a kind of quantitative element, right? What I think kind of the yeah. network is, is more associated with a kind of qualitative element. The reason why it has acquired so much fortune, the term crowd, is because I think that it reflects certain developments uh, of certain elements of the development of the World Wide Web and of internet technologies in the last 15 years. What we could describe as a massification right, of the internet. Namely, uh, if you look back to 2001, uh, the ITU, International Telecommunications Union, internet diffusion figures which were as low as 10% of the world population. The internet was a very aristocratic medium for artists, journalists, physicists, uh, researchers, then the, the marketers came and they invented spamming and, and so on and so forth. And then it, it's broadened to ever more generalized sectors of society, uh, leading to our parents and our grandparents uh, joining us online uh, to the dismay of many young people who had to escape from the social media they were on in order to escape the gaze of their parents. So that element of massification uh, I think is really crucial, or massification of the internet is really crucial to understand much of what has been going on for the last, for me, in the last decade, right? Where the discourse of the pioneering web was a discourse of the digital frontier, of uh, the amateur, of the small entrepreneur, of the digital artisan, as sometimes what was described. It was an imaginary of the small producer the idea that you could have your own home page and your own e-shop that would, would have all become like small shopkeepers. Right? That didn't really happen. Right? Instead, it moved more towards a massified and concentrated model with oligopolies, right? with uh, the GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Mm -hmm. But that also moved towards a kind of massified uh, nature in, in terms of, of the usership, right? in terms of, of, of how numbers are important. In metrics, right? uh, one of the elements of the social network sphere are the popularity metrics and the fact that a post that has two likes is different from a post that has 2,000 likes, even if they had the very same content. Right? In a way, it's the, the quantification element that enters the message. It adds an, an, an additional layer. So, I mean, I, I realize your point, Frederick, I mean, about the fact that, that some of these terms need to be kind of carefully approached as they carry an ideological language with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is basically my main reason behind uh, the, the choice. I mean, it, it, this really is kind of online mass interaction, which is, in a way, the, the new element. I mean, if, to give you an example, when you watch a live of Donald Trump on YouTube, and you see constantly comments streaming with uh, emojis, uh, like hearts, like and you, your eye, your eye cannot even follow for how, how many, you could, how fast they are cascading. 
because there are so many people there. And, and, and that is something that is, feels really new because you have never seen so many people concentrated there. I mean, that power of numbers there. Uh, and, and I think it, it's something that you see actually different latitudes of uh, online phenomena. Okay, thank you. More questions? Saman. Yeah, thank you for the lecture. Uh, it was very comprehensive. Perhaps my question is related to more about the politics part of it, where you say like um, political communication and online crowds is always like antagonist and conflict. And if we see it in the recent light of COVID-19 and the, all the debate that is going about COVID-19 vaccination, we see like a large number of crowds, both physical and online, and they are engaged into this collective action of anti-vaccination and anti-COVID-19 passports. So in terms of research and the meth methodological challenges, we, we are trying to answer it by quantifying and using metrics. But on the other hand, in terms of the policy or policy debate, we are not able to handle or to address the situation in the right way. So do you think, like, because this is a collective action at one moment and then you say it dies down, even if it's physical, how do you address that peak at the moment? Because I see a, a distortion uh, between one side where you say okay crowd is irrational but we are rational we are on the policy making side yeah but where does that interaction really happen so if you say that public addresses the policy agenda but if you see the real life working it's on working mm -hmm. we we are addressing the metrics but at the end of the day it's not having any effect so how to to challenge that or counter that, to minimize this gap <laughs> by monitoring online crowds at the same time. Sorry, the last sentence you ah, said? Okay. <laughs> I lost. No, I did you? No, 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 it's difficult. Did you? Okay, <laughs> sorry. The very last sentence, just to get you right. Like, how to handle it? Like, yeah. Because yeah. the domains are physical too and it's virtual too, but on the policy making side, we are failing. It feels like we are losing this battle, right? Yeah. Yes. So I'd say, I mean, there is a normative level or in the sense that in a way, uh, crowds have always been part of politics and they always will be, or something that resembles what, what we understand as crowds. They are kind of meet and course of people who mobilize, right? They are maybe not representative of the overall public, public opinion, but they play a very important role in mobilizing sympathy and antipathy toward in mobilizing public sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a tendency in certain liberal circles to see crowds as inherently evil and dangerous, but it is ultimately a, a, a rather elitist tendency which should be guarded against. Uh, because throughout history, uh, crowds have made history, and I mean, for both good and ill, right? And in a way, winning the battle for consensus involves uh, creating, uh, steering, and uh, appealing to crowds. Right? Uh, on the other hand, um, there is a tendency now for crowds to position themselves often in extremely simplified and down down ways around topics such as the, the pandemic, often with a kind of what Rosan Vallon would describe as a counter democratic posture, in a sense, since distrust in politics is high, the only way I can participate in politics is by saying no to anything, like even to the things that are kind of the most kind of rational or, but simply to demonstrate my unease, right? Um, in ways that actually add very little content-wise to policy debate or public debate, right? Because it's not that you can, whatever, uh, do much with people saying that bleach is an alternative cure from a kind of policy perspective. It's not that you can add bleach to the medicaments that are recommended, if it's what I mean. Like, it doesn't really add. Um, at the same time, uh, what would you say? Um, what is happening there in terms of this confrontation is very important in terms of, 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 of the battle for consensus. 
in the sense that the politicians cannot really ignore what crowds are about. They don't completely control crowds either, uh, even the populist right politicians. Uh, and therefore, they always need to keep the guard high vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is happening there. Um, what would you say? I mean, uh, perhaps a, a way to uh, the only way in which crowds can be more productive in contributing to policy debating and, and, and policy making is uh, by a, an organic process of pedagogic process of developing rules and etiquettes. Uh, Political literacy, civic literacy, uh, and the only thing political leaders can do really is <laughs> managing as best as they can uh, interaction with them because they they are never completely controllable, even by by extreme politicians. Okay. They're supposed to have them in, in their pockets. Thank you. Perhaps it was a difficult question to answer. <laughs> Perhaps one tactic there is not to do anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? In the sense that with trolling, right, is a famous don't feed the troll. Yeah. In the sense that part of these tactics are about attracting attention because for any possible on any possible topic, such as this room is that wall is what color is it? Like purple? Like or, or say that wall is white. We can all agree objectively on that. There is, in a way, always a market, so to speak, for somebody who denies that. In a scientific society, there are many things that are apparently objectively self-evident, but are deeply ingrained in anything we do. And therefore, automatically, a market is created, as it were, for people who deny those basic assumptions. You know, if you see what I mean. Partly, that market is created by a because that's a way to attract attention at a very low cost. Right? If you say the moon is not there, it's just a projection, uh, people, it's curious. Right? It will attract attention because, I mean, people, because it's strange, it's exotic. It means either that you're mad, which itself is interesting, right? Itself is curious, or uh, whatever, or there's something behind that. Uh, so, partly, I think, one of the ways in which some, some of these uh, uh, scepticism ways demonstra become very effective is when they trigger, as, as, the, as the term goes, they, they trigger liberals, which is what, what, what they aim at achieving. So by making them so angry, it becomes a post facto certification that there was something they were hiding. Right? It's quite a perverse logical circle, right? But it's like uh, it's like like when somebody accuses you of something you haven't done, and you get angry at that, and that, that is taken as ah, you see, so you have something to hide. No? So, but but the thing is, that is in a way like what is what what I'm really interested in. That is what is people understanding of this, and what are the terms of the conflict and the terms of success as well. Right? What is a troll really aiming at achieving? How will you be content in a situation, situation like that? Thank you. Cheers. Yeah. Any other question? Yes. Uh, two questions. Jose Miguel, please. So we have a question to ask you about um, the methodological challenges that you were uh, describing, basically the, the invisibility. I kept the, um, the sense that. Um, Many of uh, the empiric work that, had, uh, work that has been done in, 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 in crowd uh, politics is related to Twitter because it's easier to, to research because the API is open and you can get data. But there are a lot of uh, like discussion, online discussion spaces like 
WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube, that are more closed. How uh, would you approach this, this kind of uh, online spaces and, and what kind of uh, empirical uh, research do you recommend us to read or to, to look at? Yes, I mean, Twitter is uh, uh, overlooked by academics and overstudied. Like, it's like uh, while other, uh, well, for example, with Facebook, methodologically, there's not really that many dif difficulty because you can download all the data for a page. You need to decide better what is your unit of analysis, like vis a vis Twitter, perhaps. But you can also use ethnographic methods or simply kind of descriptive observational methods. You can look, for example, uh, at what some people conceive, uh, conceive as uh, one of the lowest places of humanity, namely the YouTube comments section and look at what kind of interactions are going on there. Right? You can look at WhatsApp. I mean, some instant messaging tools, for example, raise very serious methodological issues because you uh, need to study only locally like, different conversations if you get access to them. Right? Uh, so there, I think the methodological issues are, are huge, but there's uh, uh, basic observational tools that you can use or interviews are often a very good entry point. In a sense, like interviewing users and what is their experience, how they're seeing things, right? uh, which perhaps is uh, really an, a method of research that is not exploited enough uh, as, as much as it should, because actually gathering things from people's direct experience is often the thing that explains you the most. Because you don't only, you at the same time observe phenomena through people's eyes, and also understand the implicit rules that would not be self-evident in uh, uh, numerical di data. You have the last question. Do you have time? Yeah. The last one. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, well, lately we hear a lot about polarization in society. And I was wondering what, what are your views about the idea that this online public sphere increases polarization, no? there's a debate here, or maybe it simply makes it more visible that polarization has always existed in our mm -hmm. societies. No? What's, your opinion, what's your opinion on that? Yes, that's very interesting. I think it reflects and reinforces polarization. So polarization has not been there because we've been to a time of great moderation, which was both economic and political, for 40 years of kind of neoliberal hegemony, which was quite undisputed. And now, simply the structural situation uh, and more difficulty for people make society more polarized because people tend to be more unhappy. You know? So they're looking for more extreme solutions to things. On the other hand, though, there is a disinhibition element, typical of social media. Like, you know, society is based on social hypocrisy, on the fact that we don't tell everybody what we think of them. Like, that's what also an Arendt said, right, and, and others. Online, it feels as if we can say anything like even the things that we always thought about other people but never did say, right? So that makes it a very incendiary terrain uh, possible. And also displays what it mixes private networks and political stances, stories of brothers and sisters and friends each other around election time, right? Or uh, relatives fighting with one another. Uh, so by making things in a way more public, by making the private public, by intermixing the private and the public, indeed that can re reinforce polarization and sometimes lead to kind of toxic results. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, the precisely, obviously, coherently to what I said about politics as conflict, I also say that kind of some degree of polarization is not necessarily dangerous. I mean, it's actually healthy for democracy. So very different options, different camps. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what do you think about the the was the Washington the Capitolium assault yeah. to the crowd because there was uh, was uh, organized on the uh, online by Trump, the tweets, you know, the parlor. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about these people? Because they are organized is from the right, uh, and the difference with the left. We can we can talk, talk called crowd or mass, mm -hmm. you know, because ideological difference. 
I mean, I think that cloud is a term that can be used regardless of political uh, leanings and affiliation. It's just more of a term used for a certain type of human aggregate. Uh, I think that you could describe perfectly the 6th January uh, Capitol Hill riots uh, uh, group as, as a crowd, yeah. which indeed it was, uh, it came together for a very brief period of time. It, it would look very chaotic, someone with uh, animal fur and horns and the other one, like you could really say it was impromptu in the very visual impression of that. But it was also a crowd, because these crowds disappear, but it doesn't mean that they go nowhere. They go into a more latent phase, right? Which is in small group discussions, private circles, networks, yeah. or online, and then re the research phase they reappear. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. So let's leave here. Yes, thank you very much, Paolo. Very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your presentation and the answers to our questions. So again, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.